Last night I watched the FNAF movie. How is that a sentence that I just truthfully uttered? Let's just get into this ultra deep ultimate analysis of the movie. How many frames are there in the FNAF movie? Together, me and you are gonna find out today. Okay, um, this might shorten the video a little bit, so let's ju let's just go ahead and press on and see if we can get this done before it's too late, I guess. Um, I'll actually be reviewing this movie from the perspective of a fan of the series and a normal human being. Take a guess on which one of those I happen to be. For those of you who don't know every last thing about this franchise, like some of us might, I'll explain some of the more fan y things that you may not have picked up on because it gives them a whole lot more meaning. This is also the part of the video where you should stop watching if you haven't seen the movie yet because there are going to be heavy spoilers. Is this really where you want to be? Why would you want to stay? They added Sparky the dog, 10 out of 10. But oh my goodness, Freddy Fazbear was not kidding when he said this movie was made for the fans. Every single part of this movie is such a faithful adaptation of the source material. You can tell that it was made with the utmost care and respect for each aspect of this franchise. We got a full Five Nights at Freddy's narrative set in the exact same story and the exact same setting as the games, for better or for worse but almost entirely for the better if you're a fan of the franchise. The movie opens perfectly with the first night guard at Freddy's trying frantically to get away from all the animatronics, not unlike this situation, and he ends up getting caught and put in the stuffing machine. And the way the animatronics are handled in this scene is fantastic. We never really fully see them. They're just ominous, looming threats hiding in the background while our character tries to get away from them. The power dynamic of the antagonist is very, very important for a horror movie, and the beginning of the movie definitely nailed it, so let's see if they can hold it up for the rest of the movie. When I saw the 8-bit visuals in the opening credits, I knew we were in for an absolute treat. And then just a couple minutes later, Mike had a book called Dream Theory. Now, if you don't know, when FNAF 4 came out, it was almost confirmed that the previous three games all took place in a dream, and no one liked that. Dream Theory was altogether retconned by Scott in the later games, but this was a fun little way to tease the fans with the literal most hated version of the story of Five Nights at Freddy's. It's a nice little cameo that also fits in with the story because Mike is absolutely obsessed with revisiting his past in dreams of when his brother was kidnapped. I'll talk more about this aspect soon, but it was a great way to tie everything together in a way that made sense and made for some genuinely really good horror moments. The movie does everything in its power to make you hate Balloon Boy with a passion, even if you're not a fan, because if you're a fan, you already hate him. The funniest part is that his jump scares are some of the most impactful jump scares in the movie and he's a joke character, which just makes the joke even better. But let's seriously talk about Sparky the dog for a second. Sparky the dog was a popular hoax in the community back in 2014, around when the first game came out. A fan edited an image of a dog animatronic and put it in the background of the backstage camera, and a lot of people thought this was a real little easter egg. And now it's not a hoax anymore because it canonically exists in the FNAF movie universe. They really went and designed an entire Sparky the dog animatronic, and it shows up in the movie multiple times. But the fact that Scott and Blumhouse added this most obscure of details from the first game just shows like they put a lot of thought into all of this. And then we have Matthew Patrick, the, I honestly don't really know what to call him, but he's, he's, he's the guy. He's one of the guys on the internet and he showed up and he said, he said the thing and it was a lot better than I thought it would have been because I was kind of scared he was going to show up as a detective at the end of the movie and be like, I have a theory. That's what I was expecting. But making him this annoying waiter that's just bringing up random facts about food, it was perfect. It didn't completely break immersion, but it was just enough for me to tap my friend on the shoulder and be like, look. And then there was Corey Kenshin, of course. His cameo also didn't overstay its welcome. He's just a taxi driver. They don't really take too many victory laps with the cameos, which is perfect. It is a shame Markiplier didn't get to be in the movie, but Scott Cawthon and Blumhouse have shown that they are perfectly happy to put Markiplier in any sequel for the movie. A bit of a tangent, but it got over 10 million on its premiere night, so there's no telling how much it's gonna make in opening weekend. My point is, there's definitely gonna be sequels, so we're definitely gonna see Markiplier. The scene with Foxy hunting Abby in the arcade was incredible, all the shots look great, the tension was there, but the most significant part of this scene is that it's kind of a reference 
to both the opening and the ending of the Silver Eyes. In the Silver Eyes, the main character, Charlie, is chased around in the arcade by Foxy, and it was a very, very similar scene to the one that we saw in the movie. This is the most prominent example of a book reference in the movie, and there's quite a few of them. And I have to say, the plot of this movie works really well as a FNAF movie. It manages to reimagine and add depth to the original story while keeping the main elements largely the same. William Afton, the owner of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, killed five kids, stuffed them in the suits. Mike has a really good reason to keep coming back to the pizzeria, actually multiple good reasons to keep coming back to the pizzeria, which was one of the big things that everyone loved pointing out about the first game. Why does he come back when he knows the animatronics are dangerous? But the movie framed it in the perfect way where Mike doesn't discover that the animatronics are dangerous until it's too late to turn back. But even if he knew that they were slightly dangerous, which he kind of does at one point, he still thinks it's worth to go back, but he's still obsessed with the idea of finding out what happened to his brother. On top of that, the movie also makes sure to spread out some kills for other people in the earlier parts of the movie, that way we don't have this completely violence the void first half of the movie until things start ramping up for Mike. So I definitely think the way they paced out the animatronic scenes was perfect. Jim Henson's Creature Shop absolutely killed it with the animatronic designs. The way they show their expressiveness had me concerned at first because we're used to these dead stares from the animatronics, but the way they handled them in the movie was great in my opinion. The scene where Mike is trying to sneak past Freddy and Freddy's in the middle of performing and then just suddenly turns to look and listen, he has that same dead but unnaturally alive, uncanny kind of look to him and I loved it. Another thing is that this movie represents the FNAF franchise perfectly. All parts of the franchise, even the tone of the newer games. There are some scenes, like the fort building scene, that are really out there and really goofy. But that's FNAF for you. Ever since 2016, when the fifth game came out, the games have been leaning into their more quirky sense of humor, which doesn't always land in the games, but I think they did a great job balancing it in this movie. It may have been a little bit too much for a horror movie, but again, that's FNAF. It likes to kind of juggle two identities, and if you don't like that, that's something you don't like about FNAF, not a problem with the adaptation. I expected this movie to have wacky animatronic shenanigans, so I wasn't surprised or disappointed when this movie had wacky animatronic shenanigans. Now for the scares of this movie. I, I, I can't really say that it was very scary. There were some brutal scenes for sure, which was a bit of a pleasant surprise because I was worried that it would be a little bit too sanitized. I was going into it expecting it to be a little too sanitized. I think it pushed the boundaries of what you can do in a PG-13 movie to the absolute max. But FNAF has always been mostly implied violence over explicitly shown violence. Again, this really just makes it feel like a more faithful adaptation to the games. The general atmosphere is still really grim and unsettling. The world that the movie builds is just it just feels so dark in every corner. I don't even know how to describe it, but if you watch the movie, you know what I'm talking about. The way the cupcake moves around is just, it, it's hilarious. Like, it, it doesn't work as far as logic goes, but it's a fun little cheesy element to add. At this point, I believe the whole Susie's dog theory about the cupcake because you can't tell me it's not a dog with the way it goes after Mike's leg. It is literally the pit bull named Cupcake from all the memes. Hank's death had a really good element and one part of it, but the rest of it is just funny. And it was meant to be funny. The way Bonnie appears behind him for a split second before his eyes light up, that hits hard. Max's brother, when he dies, the foxy jump scare did not get me at all, and that's coming from someone who doesn't handle jump scares all too well. But it was really cool to see the way Foxy stood at the end of the hallway. It looked amazing. It was awesome. I'm not complaining that we got it. And Max's death, Max's death is, is just sad. She did not want to be there. She was dragged into it by her brother. She wasn't even smashing the place up. And then she dies trying to help out a kid who she thought was stuck in this spare Freddy suit. And yes, we know it was a spare Freddy suit and not the real Freddy because we see half of it sitting in the parts and service room later in the movie when Mike wakes up in parts and service and sees all the bodies, which that scene was one of those scenes where it's like, oh my goodness, they pushed the PG-13 with that one. I don't know whose face it was that was all mangled up. I think it was Carl, but that was more than I was expecting to see, and that genuinely did hit. Because the movie has these lighthearted moments, the horror moments just, they go crazy when they decide to go for it. And then there's the reveal that the ghost children like Abby, but they don't exactly know how to play nice or play safely. It's extremely disturbing after that silly fort building scene because it shows that they had devious intent the entire time. 
and it shows just how dehumanized they've been at this point. They're willing to kill a child just to have a new playmate because they genuinely don't understand what it's like to be human anymore. Their minds have been so irreparably twisted by Afton at this point. That dream scene where the kids initially tell Mike that they want Abby, it's terrifying. And when he eventually rejects their offer to live forever in a dream, and everything just disappears, that is the type of psychological horror that I was scared we wouldn't see any of in this movie. But it delivered. The dream scenes in general were just tense, mysterious. The dream scenes kind of felt more like the game than the scenes in the pizzeria did, which isn't bad because they were honestly the bulk of the first few nights in the pizzeria. The scene where Vanessa tells Mike what happened to the kids' bodies, that goes so hard. The way the score is building up and the way it shows the animatronics and the way it builds up to everything, it pays off so incredibly well right there. As soon as people discovered that Abby's name was an anagram for baby, they all lost their minds. Even Matt Pat said that he thought baby would stumble and fall into a clown animatronic at the end of the movie, and that's what the movie is trying to make you think. That doll that they try to stuff her in is terrifying, is also a great way to introduce the spring locks. It's also a recreation of Ella the doll from both the Silver Eyes novel trilogy and the Fazbear Frights books, which is a really cool and really obscure extra book reference to add to the list. This doll shows that the franchise has a pretty loaded history as far as all the dolls and mascots that have been present, and I'm assuming that this will be explained and explored more in the sequel, which I'm feeling like may be a prequel to match the second game, could definitely be wrong, but a FNAF prequel would make a lot of sense because they did leave a lot of things unexplained in a way that only a prequel or a movie with heavy flashbacks would be able to explain. William Afton, the man himself. Steve Raglan is a tricky one. He manages to be one of the main problems and one of the highlights of the movie at the exact same time. Spring Bonnie's appearance, his entrance is amazing. He looks so intimidating. The way he moves is perfect. It's a whole new threat introduced to the mix compared to the other animatronics. The way Vanessa reveals the image of Spring Bonnie back when the restaurant was still open. Oh, his mascot costume is the perfect mix of this thing is terrifying, what on earth is it doing here? And oh yeah, I could see that as something that actually would exist back in the 80s. Matthew Lillard did an absolutely phenomenal job portraying William Afton as this sadistic, controlling lunatic. I'm not saying that the character of William is perfect in this movie because it's far from perfect, but all of the issues seem to come from the script and not Matthew's performance. The way he talks to the band saying that he has something for them to play with is, it's just perfect. You can tell that he's talking to children, but you can tell that he's also been programming them mentally over the years to think in this, again, twisted and inhuman way. You can tell that he likes to be one of them, one of the mascots, and he loves the fact that they consider him to be one and trust him. This is an aspect that's borrowed straight from the first book, The Silver Eyes, from back in 2015. But I will say, I kind of wish they had leaned more until The Silver Eyes William Afton, because in The Silver Eyes, when he puts on the suit, he dances around, he has a lot more confidence than he does without it. And it seems like half of his soul is in this suit. He loves, more than anything else, playing this character that's a part of him, putting on this performance that he's been perfecting for a lifetime. I wish we had seen more of him enjoying the chase, enjoying being Spring Bonnie once again. Instead we kind of see him, he's more angry and maniacal than insanely gleeful and playful at what he's doing. And part of me feels like that's because they're saving some of that for the sequel slash prequel. Again, that's speculation from me, but it would make a whole lot of sense to try to save some of that for the sequel. I'm not saying I like that choice necessarily. Of course, I can't mention the yellow rabbit without mentioning the scene, the incident. And a lot of people were really underwhelmed by it. And I can definitely see why. I'm sure they were expecting something a lot more like the Silver Eyes Springlock scene or the FNAF 3 Springlock scene, where pretty much all the Springlocks all go off all at once and he lets out this blood curdling scream and you can hear bones snapping and it's just an instant and then he's completely decimated. But here's why I kind of like this version as well. I can see both sides and the scene definitely would have hit harder if he had just been completely overcome and screamed at what was happening. It seems like Scott's idea of what a springlock scene looks like 
has changed over the years, mostly because of the fourth Tales from the Pizzaplex book, Somnophobia. There's one story called Pressure where a kid puts on a springlock suit and it slowly starts going off like it does in the movie. One springlock at a time and the kid, it's really tragic, just slowly loses the ability to walk, to speak, to function, and eventually dies. I'm assuming Scott was writing this or overseeing this book at the same time as thinking about the movie and he just kind of had that transition to, oh, the springlock should be this, this moment where you realize your fate, but it's just slowly fusing you with the animatronic one part at a time. It's not as dramatic as the FNAF 3 version, but it's definitely a unique and valid take on the incident. Another reason why I don't necessarily mind the toned down reaction that William has to the Springlock scene is because, like this one commenter said, and I didn't think about it this way until I saw this comment, that William kind of enjoys and accepts what's happening to him pretty early on in a sick twisted way he liked the idea of getting a taste of his own medicine like what he did to those kids was a fantasy of his that he wouldn't mind also happening to himself and i think that really shows just how far gone this man is. If you aren't already a fan of this movie and you're thinking about watching it, I recommend watching some of MatPat's game theories on FNAF 2 and FNAF 3's story before watching the movie if you want to understand why some of the moments that happen are as impactful as they're meant to be for fans. The biggest issue with my viewing experience of this movie were the row of kids behind me who would not stop giggling and talking at the worst possible times in the opening scenes of the movie. Me and my friend literally had to turn around and tell them to stop talking. And thankfully they were smart enough to stop talking after that because I would have gone over there. One of the missed opportunities in this movie is the opportunity to flash back to the 80s when the missing children incident happened because in the Freddy Fazbear security footage that Universal posted, there was the scene of the news reporter talking about the missing children, which I think would have added a lot of weight to the incident and the way people talked about it. And of course, it would have been great to see Spring Bonnie performing and showing how charismatic he was with the kids to the point where they would trust him and follow him because that betrayal of trust in a place of fun is what makes this terrifying. And it kind of fell into the same trap that the game lore fell into where the major events that define everything else happened off screen and we never get to properly see them except for in true FNAF fashion we see that exact same thing in the 8-bit minigame visuals and the opening credits. That is the one thing that I'm like why was that not in the movie? I feel like this may be a thing where it's kind of saving it for the sequels. I hope there's at least a reason for why that wasn't in the movie. Back to Willie A. Like I said, Matthew Lillard did a fantastic job, but the writing didn't do the character justice, in my opinion. First of all, we don't get any motive for why he's doing any of this. Apparently, he just enjoys killing kids for the fun of it. He speaks in an almost childish way, which was going to be a criticism for me at first, but it kind of plays into his character of relating to these kids, spending time with these kids that are now lost souls, in the animatronic suits and the way he talks to them after they turn on him when the lights flash on him and he calls them vile rotten disgusting beasts at first i was like okay that's just dumb dialogue it's important to remember that these are children that he's talking to it reminded me of the way cult leaders manipulate their victims even older victims who are nearly adults or actual adults they slowly brainwash and gaslight them into thinking that they have all the answers, that they're the only ones who can protect these people. And that's, I think that's what the movie was trying to convey with Spring Bonnie. I really do love that idea though. The idea that the man who murdered these children, tricking them into thinking that he's their one and only friend and guide in this confused existence that they're still trapped in. And back to my previous point about not flashing back to the 80s. If we had gone back, we could have seen, we could have seen Spring Bonnie performing, enjoying himself like he does in the Silver Eyes, and eventually doing the deed, or at least starting to or showing small parts of it. This ties into the motive criticism, but I really want to know why he kidnapped Garrett, what happened to Garrett, which quick little speculation, theory, throwing it out there, sequel, if it's a sequel and not a prequel, the puppet, I'm predicting that's Garrett, because 
It has the same elements as the FNAF 2 minigame where we see the child possessing the puppet getting murdered. William Afton drives up in his car. I think if that's the case, Garrett is the puppet who is leaving the it's me messages in the movie. Because just think about that. If Garrett's soul is still around as the puppet, he's the one who gave the animatronics life at some point because William kidnapped him before the other missing children's incident happened and Garrett knows that Mike is there and he's saying, it's me, it's me. This is not related to William Afton, but this didn't deserve its own section, but we never get to see Freddy doing the Torador March thing at any point, which is weird because Freddy's theme song is Torador March in the games. That is the most iconic thing about FNAF at this point. It was all in the trailers, Torador March the whole time, and it never showed up in the movie, which was really, really odd to me. I know horror movies are generally supposed to be short and sweet, but I think all of the issues I just mentioned could have been almost entirely fixed by just giving the movie a little bit more screen time. Because it almost seemed like the movie wanted to show these things, or we even saw parts of them in the trailers, but they just didn't end up there because the movie was trying to tie itself up a little bit too quickly. So I feel like another 20 to maybe even just 10 minutes of screen time would have done wonders for the third act because the climax could have used a little bit more time to breathe and build up to certain things. But I do truly believe that once the trilogy comes together, Scott will tie everything up in a way that feels satisfying. If you made it to this point in the video, comment follow the yellow rabbit with no other explanation to confuse and creep out everyone else. The more I think about these issues, the more they just seem like nitpicks. Seeing the Rotten Tomato score and reviews before watching the movie really messed up my mindset going into the movie as much as I tried not to let that happen. And I'll just say, don't let that happen to you. Go watch the movie, and if you already watched it, which you should have already watched it before watching this video, make sure and watch it again and just think, what do I think about this movie? Don't let the critical fans change your mind. Don't let the critics who are just doing their job change your mind or make you angry. Just watch the movie and like it if you like it and dislike it if you dislike it. They could have played this movie much safer than they did and they didn't. They could have removed everything that made this movie a FNAF movie, but they didn't. It could have been geared much more towards children, but it wasn't. What we got was a massive thank you to the fans with plenty of room for a sequel. I'm also moving all my long form content to this channel, gradually transitioning to that. So subscribe or at least look at that channel and stay tuned for 